Oh, we're on the air. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the Planning Commission meeting of the City of Calabasas of December 7, 2023. Um, I, oh, we do have one of the liaisons here. I can't, right? Okay. So we've got Maddie Strauss here. And uh, uh, we do have um, uh, Commissioner Leah, who's absent, ex has an excused absence, and we have a new member. Uh, Alan Pine, but he's not here. Uh, and um, but when he comes, we'll we'll ask him uh, to tell us about himself. Um, so first, we've got the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, see, Matt, can you can you lead us sure. in the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, announcements. Um, let's start with, uh, okay, Wendy. Um, Dennis, you'd like to go last. So, John, do you have Nothing any? this evening, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I, I'll, um, well, first of all, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah, which starts now. Um, <laughs> And uh, I got to go home and light the candles afterwards. But uh, there will be a community menorah lighting and celebration at the Commons on Tuesday, um, December 12th at 6.30 p.m. And that's sponsored by the Calabasas Shul Chabad and Congregation Orami. Um, also, we lost um, John Suara last week. Oh. He was um, one of the 2021 Calabasas Citizens of the Year and he was one of the founders of the Calabasas Coalition. So it's, hmm. it's a big loss to the city and to his family, and I'd like to adjourn in his honor if that's all right. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Certainly. Um, Dennis. Uh, I was just going to do what you just did. I oh, I'm sorry. announced that John passed and that we should remember him in the in journey tonight. Okay. Well, thank you. And, uh, so the next item on the agenda is oral communications, uh, public comment for matters that are applicable to the Planning Commission. I like that extra phrase that Matt put in, uh, but not on our agenda. Is there any, I don't have any cards for that. Does anybody want to speak on something that's not on the agenda? No? Okay, then we'll move on to the consent items. And really it's only the first con item is consent item. The second item is, n is not consent. We have speakers and you know, that's for discussion. And John was, uh, John was going to uh, look at that item. So anyway, so the first item, approval of minutes for November 16, 2023. Um, is there a motion to approve or, or are there any corrections or? I have a question about the minutes. Uh, th there's an oddball phrase in it and um, it has to do with, uh, actually it's in, the right page. On page four, there is a, the way the paragraph reads, um, on uh, paragraph four, commission asks questions utilizing blah, blah, blah. And then it says, um, include topics to include green building codes, native landscaping, artificial turf tree. It reads okay. But I think the point that we were making and have been making on a regular basis is no artificial turf. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that it probably is correct, so I'll move the minutes with that comment. That's all. Second. Um, any any other discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that passes unanimously then. Um, so next we have item two, which again shouldn't have been a consent item, but this is uh, adoption of resolution 2023-782, approving file. Number site plan review 2020-002, consistent with the commission's direction on, on November 2nd, 2023. Um, I've got, um, all right, so you, we're, we're all here and able, you, you, John, you were able to. Uh, I, I reviewed the entire file and I listened to the entire tape from, uh, I think it was November 2nd. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes I did. Terrific. So we can all participate. Um, 
It's not a public hearing item, so we'll just, I guess, we, uh, but I've got two speakers. Yeah, so. If there are any speakers, because it's on the agenda, not a public hearing, but we'll still take Okay, take so I'd like, comment. so um, I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Sheldon, uh, would you like to go up or Mr. Dornfest? I, you, you both have cards here. Chair so. Harrison, I'm just do you want to start wondering if you might allow me to make some clarifications. There are some changes to oh, the staff. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know there were. Okay, go ahead. And there, I had some things on the dais for you. See, it, it was put in a consent, so. Uh, this it, came up after the agenda had been published. So where is it? It's the. So I, there's a memo that is before each of you in hard copy dated today. Ah, okay. Me. Why don't you but tell you us about it? But you don't have to read that word for word. I'm about to tell you what's in it. Go ahead, tell us. Okay. So there are three things you need to be aware of. I received communication from the applicant and ap applicant's representatives regarding ownership of the properties and what they're moving forward to accomplish and also about um, authorization from the ownership entity for the adjoining parcel 3460, I think is the address, <clears throat> Mylac Trail, and this is immediately south of the subject. There is some off-site grading, which everybody noted, and we had some discussion about that previous meeting. So this authorization permits that off-site grading. Now, that is in an email form. We've communicated in response that we will need eventually something that is a bit more substantial with a signature and literature in letter form. And we have now added to the resolution of approval a new condition. It's in there as condition 35 that requires that, that we, they would submit that documentation before we can issue grading permits. So I wanted you to know that. I also amended the resolution to encompass the, not only the November 2nd meeting, but the November 16th meeting. And then uh, there was a date correction for today being the date that the resolution, if approved, would be executed. Okay. That's it. All right, any questions about that? Okay, then, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Sheldon, do you want to speak? Yes, please. Just let us know where you're from, uh, the city you're from, and go ahead. I live in Topanga, adjacent community nearby. I'm an architect and worked on this project. Uh, there was some uh, definite concerns uh, on the project, the one that uh, both addressed the project as I was drawing it and concerns me was about retaining walls and that the structure was benched into the hill with the retaining wall behind it, that there was retaining and or, or moisture concerns. This is concerning for a variety of reasons. This is standard construction practice all over the world. It's built here in the city. This in the Highlands area, majority of the houses there are built benched into the hill with a similar condition. So although I've been in the business over 40 years and study this and read journals and magazines, I've never heard of a restriction like this to not put in habitable space up against a retaining wall. Um, apparently there was some concern about some previous failure of some type of thing in Calabasas, but we didn't get details on that w failure, what it was, what had caused it, and how it should be addressed. And not that I really think that's a planning issue. I think that's a building department issue. But it certainly is a concern for all of us, and well, architects in particular, we hate to see our buildings fall down or get wet. Um, and obviously there are occasionally fa failures. There's failures in design, failures in engineering, failures in uh, approval, but, and of course, mostly in construction. People are going around doing things like inviting tons of bidders and then selecting the low bidder. Who made the biggest mistake? Who's going to do the cheapest materials and the least labor? And or just has a lapse. The humans installing things, the supervision or the labor, made some small lapse. Again, I think this is a building department issue, not a planning issue. Um, and I certainly don't see anything in the planning or zoning codes that address this. But as I say, it certainly is a concern for me. Um, but this project, as the conditions state, we are having all of our engineers address this. We have soils and geoengineers telling us what we can anticipate 
from the earthwork around there. These da this data is given to the structural engineer and the civil engineer who are designing the systems that put it in place. These systems are always redundant. They either are dual or even triple uh, redundant for waterproofing. We tend to put the waterproofing on the wall, then a drainage board, then a membrane, then gravel, then another membrane. Um, there's whole systems that are done th this way. And this is standard building practice. Again, it's most upsetting to think that there's a, the planning commission is gonna put in a blanket restriction uh, for no work a uh, habitable work up against a retaining wall. It, it's, it strikes me seriously. Uh, it's like you guys coming along and saying, wait a minute, flat roofs will leak. 10, 20 years, they're gonna leak. Okay, make it illegal to have it in a flat roof. I don't, I think these are engineering issues. This is something for the building department. We have hired professionals to deal with this. <coughs> what the conditions of approval are that these drawings will be com after the conception of this plan is approved by the planning department. We com the engineers will complete their drawings and engineering. This will all be submitted to the building department for review and uh, it's a condition that I had put in for working in hillsides in my drawings is that they hire a, a dedicated waterproofing contractor. This is not just, oh, the general's gonna go and put a few laborers down there with some tar paper or something. So definitely um, and the owners were, uh, uh, ownership uh, people were fine with that. They said they certainly did not want this to fail, either structurally or have any moisture issues. Uh, none of us want to deal with mold or anything of that nature. So uh, I do, do not, did not understand exactly where this thing about the retaining walls came from, but I don't think it's uh, an appropriate factor for denial of the planning approval. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman? Of course. I think you just offered a condition, but it wasn't clear, about a waterproofing expert. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is not in the current conditions that is new and you propose to offer it? I am putting it in, in the plans. Yeah, it's a standard thing that I do because. Uh, and just describe a little bit more just, what it is. Just, what, what I hate for things to fall through the cracks. Yeah, now just tell me what this person is so that I can craft a condition to make it enforceable. Oh. Well, there are specialty contractors that do waterproofing. Waterproofing experts up here in the valley is one of them that I've used uh, several times. Um, and they come around, they do all the flashing up at the roof. They tie in the, uh, all the, uh, the flashing membranes, at the, all the different things at the deck. Um, it has uh, obviously many, many years ago, and, and today it still happens. People, people will just go and, and, oh, I need a piece of flashing. Go down to the sheet metal shop and, hey, can you give me a bent L or this with a drip edge or whatever. Um, and it is a, um, you want a, somebody with experience construction experience to deal with these issues. Do you know whether or not this, these waterproofing experts are uh, licensed by the state? Oh yeah, they're licensed contractors. So, so it, is, it is a different license than a general contractor or a roofing contractor? No, they're usually general contractors, but they specialize in waterproofing. I think that's what you're saying, right? I do not claim familiarity. I do know, you know there's all these different licenses, C36, 350. You know, I, I'm not familiar with all those designations, so I can't speak to if they have a specific license number. I just know that um, it is my recommendation and practice to use experienced contractors. If, if I may also point out that under the building code, they have to do it correctly into code, and that has to be inspected before they can backfill. Well, I, I'm only asking these questions because I'm always uh, happy to consider a, a new condition that an applicant proposes uh, to better the project. And that's why I thought I heard that this is something different than was part of the package uh, proposed on November 2nd. And if this is like, for example, sometimes, for example, sometimes we'll get 
an applicant and during the course of the discussion, he or she will say, and I will provide a certified arborist to do X. And I say, wonderful, condition 77. And I make that uh, part of the conditions. And that's what I'm asking. Are we going to, are you proposing that there be a waterproofing expert, however they're licensed, however they're designated, that is different than what you were talking about on November 2nd? Is this a new thing? It's something that was not specifically addressed. Okay. So I guess to that regard, it is a new thing, yes. And yes, we would ag agree that uh, to that as a condition. And is this a person who will be there for um, certain identifiable portions of the retaining wall uh, uh, construction? Or is it just somebody who comes along at the end and says, oh, okay. Oh, no, 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 they, they will actually install it. This, um, the, the, the waterproofing, for instance, on the retaining wall is a multi-step process um, that is done, uh, and, and that is one of the places where you don't want some laborer out there and he, oh, he missed some little spot or some seam or something. So no, that's one of the conditions that they would specifically install. Uh, you know, they'd specifically supply and install the flashings uh, and the different waterproof um, uh, membranes that interact between all the different uh, components of the building. You know, like uh. so, so how the, the, the windows uh, at, into the stucco, et cetera. Th th those are the things that I uh, am concerned with. And then I think I saw somewhere in here that the, the, the um, retaining wall is proposed to be constructed using shotcrete technique as opposed to form, uh, as opposed to, you know, the, 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 um, the forms where you pour the concrete in. So this is more like we used to call it gunite in the old days. I don't believe that that has been specified. It, I saw the word shot created. No, that has not been specified for this project. Yet. There are, um, I have not seen, the, the structural engineer has not uh, finalized the structural drawings yet that would include whether that's, for instance, block, pour to place, or, sh or, or shot. I see. Okay. That's, that's something that will uh, be decided down the line? Yeah. Obviously. And I just, the reason I ask it is, is this waterproof expert have anything to do with the that aspect of the retaining wall? No, they would come in behind the retain. Basically, you know, they over excavate, uh, the structural portion is uh, constructed, and then there's a multi step uh, waterproofing that is, is applied, uh, if you will, uphill, so to speak, and outboard of the retaining wall. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. I appreciate it. Well, certainly. Hey, Michael, can I tag on to what John has asked? Sure, I have a question to go ahead, because this, um, is, this is the big concern. Well, so. there, uh, there's a report that's attached uh, from M3 Civil. Yes, sir. And it's quite detailed, from what I can tell. And this, coupled with your suggestion or your commitment, essentially, in the building design and development of this installation, that you always do this in your projects and you are going to do it for this project and that's to make sure that the waterproofing and everything else works. Yes, the civil engineer, the one that you're referring to yeah. there, he helps design the hydro hydrology systems. Right. Uh, the, uh, like for instance, these waterproofing systems, where does that water go? It, in this particular case, we have a really nice easy condition. We basically just day daylights, so it's gravity. I'm a big fan. Well, I think that what John is picking up here is what I uh, hadn't thought of as, as such, but is indicated by your design and, I guess, development procedures that you do personally as a professional. And what's indicated in this M3 civil letter that's in the packet, I thought that answered everything quite well. The only issue that I think John is asking for is can we learn from your commitment to this project that maybe this ought to be a requirement when there is a similar kind of additional you know, future uh, construction situation that we're going to face in this community? Because we can learn from you guys as much as we tell you you have to learn from our regulations. So well, is, is that where you're going with this, John? That, that's my question to you. Well, that, that's sort of a follow-up. I was really only directing my questions at this project, but it certainly is educational about other, other retaining wall situations. Well, it, it addresses Michael's uh, initial uh, concern about is it going to work? Yeah. And um, what, what is our guarantee it is going to work? This report 
your commitment, any approval that we might give at this point from this consideration this evening pretty much memorializes what we're talking about. It could be project specific or it could be generally an educational thing for the city to consider when it faces similar circumstances when we're building into a hillside, which is almost all the time in Calabasas, <laughs> you know, so, and that's your point in Topanga as well. Yes, and sir. We, we all want it to last, and then we all want it to, uh, you know, protect the residents and the neighbors. So I'm satisfied that uh, at the very least you've answered the questions that we have been posing to you and to our staff. Uh, and uh, I think that we might, after Michael's questions and comments, we, yeah, we, we can move on from this subject. But maybe our attorney has an opinion on this as well. I was going to say staff's prepared to recommend some language for a condition along the lines discussed if you'd like. Okay. Um, can I speak? Of uh, course. All right. I, I, sure. All right. I, um, <laughs> I'm interested in that pro proviso having a contractor. And by the way, they are just general contractors because I actually had dealt with a couple in a situation where it did fail. That, that's why I know about this, unfortunately. And, and it failed. So first of all, it may not have been constructed perfectly. We don't know because it was a previous builder. But it failed because of tree roots. And I know there are no planned trees back there, but if there are any trees that are put behind that house, they, those roots, depending on the tree, can destroy anything you do, anything you plan. Uh, they, but they can also put tree, I mean, we can add a provision that there's, if trees are planted, that you can put, a, they call them like a root barrier or something, so that they don't go that direction. Interesting. I had uh, obviously trees. You see them do amazing things over time. They will yeah, over time they, they lift. They can lift concrete inches, you know, in in, in, in the air. I mean, it's amazing how strong they are <clears throat> over time. A certain certain ones. So we're not going to be here. We're not going to know what tree somebody may plant there. It may not be Mr. Dornfest. You know, it's not <clears throat> blocking his view. He's he's like. Uh, behind the neighboring lot, I believe, his house. Well, so, as much as we'd like, that no nothing lasts forever, but we do try to make every effort we can to make these things as durable as, as we practically can. Right, so we can't sit, put a, I guess we can't put a provision in for the future, somebody should put, tree, you know, if a per person puts a tree root no, in, tree in they should put tree root barriers in because we, that's just way in the future. And well, if you're, if you're writing you know, code, that's a different assignment. We well, don't do and, that. You yeah, know, there, right. there, there are a lot, there, there's that's, always the what if, and if you put in root barriers, the roots eventually will go around. Oh. Um, and <laughs> possibly find right. their way back. In. Nothing is nothing is a hundred percent right. proof. Right. So and, that's you not. Know, we, can, we can do this right. all day. Right. And so, but night that long. isn't the builder's problem. That comes later. But that's why I'm concerned about this. But I am familiar with contractors who do nothing but what you're talking about. So I'm comfortable with that. Do you want to write uh, the language? The language that Matt wants. I have some words, but if you oh, you go, I'm, you go I'm first. happy to read what I've got. So. This would be a new condition to be added after condition 52 and the others we numbered. Applicants shall have a waterproofing plan prepared by a licensed contractor, comma, submitted to the city engineer for approval, comma, before issuance of any grading or building permit and shall implement the waterproofing plan as approved to the satisfaction of the city engineer. And I'm leaving vague which kind of contract because I don't have the contractor license numbers in my head, but a licensed contractor prepare a plan, submit a plan, get it approved, and then do it. Well, just to be clear, it can be a general contractor, yeah. or it can be a C39 roofing contractor. Yeah. There's no, yeah, there's no, seen, there's no right. waterproofing. Right. Yeah. Special I, licensed right. contractor waterproofing cover. license. But there are people who specialize in but, it, let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah. You, I mean, you could, don't you have in there with waterproofing expertise? Or yeah, we can add fact? that. Yeah. yeah. Licensed contractor with waterproofing expertise. Well, th this seems to me that it's not anything more than you're not willing to do. Double negatives, but you've already <laughs> said that you know, you're going to make sure that it's a safe wall and uh, that it'll last as long as we can conceivably imagine. So That's been my intent, and right. that's why I had, uh, that, that's why I put, put that in this particular, uh, this set of, the, had discussed this with the owner and got the agreement to put, 
to put this in this project, yes. Uh, do we want to, Mr. Dornfest, do you want to speak? Because you've got a card in as well. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Sheldon. Uh, good evening, Planning Commissioners. Uh, I, I've been a longtime resident of the city of Calabasas, and I uh, just want to clarify a couple of things. Um, way back in 2006, deja vu, <laughs> um, we came before the Planning Commission for a larger project on this, that was on this site. It was for two houses. Uh, one of the members was here, uh, Commissioner Mueller. And back then, uh, we had, it was a larger project and there were different issues and there was some opposition and we had lots of meetings, um, but it ended up the Planning Commission voted in favor of two, two houses. It went before the City Council um, and we have a, uh, Commissioner Washburn that was on the City Council it went before them, and it was approved for two houses. So this is a scale back of that project. It's, it's one house. And we've been longtime residents of, in the Highlands, and um, we wanted to have a house built that met our more current needs. And that's sort of like how the design went. We, a lot of houses there have like a... The typical is you have a garage and then you walk up to the upper levels. But in this house, you can drive in and it only takes three stairs to get to the main living area. And we had the ADU. We thought that was appropriate. That's what a lot of are, are being done now on the first level because that would give some privacy. Um, uh, that's a, instead of being like an apartment where you have an ADU crammed in with the main house, uh, crammed four feet to from the property line, like the back property line. We kept distances, so we were 15 feet from the back property line. Um, we, we did a lot of revisions. We thought we have a really good plan here that met the needs of a house that, if we were gonna move in, we'd wanna move in there. And, or some other resident. We wanna go with top quality construction and so our current house is a similar layout. It has a, the, the first level is habitable, habitable area in a hillside. And there's two levels up above, um, including the garage. And um, immediately behind this house is a similar layout and to the other side. So there's three houses with a similar layout of a lower level, and it's built into the hillside with two levels on top. I've never heard from any of the neighbors or us that the habitable area was unlivable because of water or drainage issues. Um, we build this on bedrock, or ver if not in the bedrock, we build caissons into the bedrock. And then uh, we put these walls up and we waterproof it. And I agree with all the comments that water is susceptible to leaks, like a roof, like a pipe. Um, I hear that a lot, like water's a problem. Um, but th this area, this, this hillside that we're on has three houses with similar layouts. And we also looked at what's in the code, like what's in the building code. And they have a picture of this layout, like, you want us to step the house up the hill. You want us to do like a level, then another level, then another level. That's, that's the picture in the, in the code. So, so we went with that. Um, you know, so as for the retaining wall, you know, we've lived there for over 20 years. It's always been habitable. The neighbors have lived there longer. Their houses are habitable on the lower level. Um, and I did some research because this issue came up and I realized, um, well, what's the latest out there? And so I talked to professionals and I understand that the waterproofing standards today are the best they've been in the history of construction. And the waterproofing manufacturers have many 
products that are applicable. You can go to different ones, they have different products, such as a very popular one called Mirror Drain, which um, our architect mentioned, has different drainage systems, different types, and they stayed on their website. For more than 45 years, they have been providing watertight, reliable waterproofing solutions suited to a variety of job site condition, conditions, offering time-tested and innovative systems that incorporate the latest waterproofing technologies. So they have different systems. Um, I anticipate our architect and the engineers will come up with a good one. If there's something I can do to make it more waterproof, I'm all for it. If there's an extra layer, but it's a design, and they'll design it. Um, like any mechanical system, some of them don't last. You get a good car, you got to keep it repaired or you know, last, a roof. Um, so it probably will take some maintenance. Um, uh, and so, so anyway, to sum it up, this project is similar to the one that was approved in 2006. That was for two houses. This is for one house. And we plan to play, pay close attention to the retaining wall and wa waterproof construction so there, so there are not significant issues for the future homeowners and so they can enjoy the amenities of the city of Calabasas, which we've all enjoyed. Uh, we would appreciate your approval. Thank you. Thanks. Any, could you stay a second? Any questions? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Uh, Tom and, and, and Mr. Dornfest may need to weigh in. I'm not sure. I couldn't find the, con the normal. Where's the normal condition that says this uh, permit uh, is valid for a year and 10 days? I'll have to look. Okay. I, I just, I, I, maybe I just missed it. Well, we'll find it or we'll put it in. But what it, that means what has to happen within a year? Well, there's, they should have applied for building permits. Condition have, number three. Have that in process so we're in plan check. That's oh. what that means. Okay, so. And it's structured as two years. Pardon me? Uh, it's condition number three, and it's structured as uh, approval will be valid for two years from the final approval date uh, and then can be extended per the code. And, um, and that's right. That's something that Maureen worked on a while back, I remember now. The one-year thing proved to be one hassle after another because, especially with more complex projects and due to changing financial market issues and that sort of thing, we were faced with um, property owner after property owner that couldn't get all of their building permits and those plans through the process and their financing and meet that one year and 10 days. Oh. So they were always okay. asking for an extension. So that's why it now says two years because, so that we didn't have to go through that process every time. And we're talking about page uh, six. six, item three, correct? Yeah. Where we're talking about shall be valid for two years from the final approval date. And the reason I'm asking this is in connection with this rather peculiar ownership situation. Um, we're, we're essentially, if, if approved, granting a, a sort of kind of an inchoate condition that says uh, this applicant will work out all of the legal issues in connection with this and will have to prove to the city that those are all worked out in order to proceed. Correct. Um, I've been here a long time and I haven't seen a, a, a situation like this. Um, and so it, it's sort of, I don't know if it's a condition preceding or something. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a bizarre okay. situation. But if the, if the commission and the city are comfortable with um, uh, essentially putting uh, time frames so that if they don't work, for whatever reason, they don't work out their ownership issues, the clock is ticking and they won't be able to proceed uh, if they don't meet this, if they don't get it all done and fixed and approved and do whatever they have to do within this two year window. So, I mean, I guess that's the hammer, although I'm not crazy about it because it just seems, I, I don't, intuitively, I don't like the idea of, 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 an, of a sort of amorphous applicant getting an approval from us in the city. Um, but I think with the condition, what is it, 81? 82. 82, 82 and combined with this condition of approval three, where the city is protected, they're not going to be able to proceed until this, this legal conundrum is resolved. 
Is that a fair summary? That's correct. The property owner will have to solve the, the present legal issues regarding ownership to ensure that that is solved before any grading or building permits can be issued. Well, technically, it isn't the property owner because there is the property owner is you know dissolved. And by the way, it's two properties. Correct, and uh, that's what because can I one is like signing agreement with the uh, you know to you know, uh, and so it doesn't make sense because neither one of these corporations exists. Can I interject, please? Oh yeah. Okay, so some so some clarification. So some of the terminology of ownership was used rather loosely during this process, and there was some confusion. So just to clarify. Um, there is no, in my mind, no property ownership issue. Uh, what, and maybe it's the bureaucracy of, of uh, Secretary of State. They use the terminology dissolved when the, the corporation has not dissolved. It's, it merely moved from Nevada to Wyoming. Well, uh, uh, we can debate that. Yeah, the, I'm not sure I would accept the, that the, statement. The Nevada Secretary of State says both of those corporations are dissolved. And because they're dissolved for more than five years, you can't revive them. They're, they're not merged out. That's what it says. Uh, uh, it, so I'm not, hold, let me We don't need here. to go there. Yeah, but, I'm not an expert in Nevada law. I'm right. not licensed in Nevada, nor are you. Right. We're both licensed in California. But, the issue is as to the California documentation, the we, present owners of the properties, Grand Eagle Inc. and Lookout Ridge Inc. Actually, no, both, let me correct Hold you. on a second. No, no, because you let got me, it wrong. They're not ink. There's no ink on either one of them. There, so look at the per title. The, the, the California State Secretary of State records, no. Grand Eagle Inc. and Lookout no. Ridge Inc. No. Both. Hold no. on. Let me no. finish my sentence. It's, it's, finish, not, it's not Inc. Michael, though, I'm reading the documents from the state. Hold on. Okay. I have them as well. There's Hold no on. Okay. Grand Eagle Inc. Lookout Ridge Inc. Both surrendered the right to transact business in California, signed by Mr. Dornfest, December 28th, 2011. December 28, 2011, both filed with Secretary of State, and these documents are in the file. That means those two corporations are no longer authorized to conduct business in California. Per the records of the city, Grand Eagle and Lookout Ridge, Inc. implied, are the owners of record under LA County's records. That situation is what has to be solved. How it is solved is not the, something we're going to dictate. Correct. That's not our... It must right. be solved, but we are not right. dictating how. Right. Condition number 82 is right. what requires right. to be solved. I just don't think it's as simple as what you make it sound like. It, but we don't have to solve it for right. him. Right. But okay. I, but well, I, with, all, well, with all due respects, uh, there are, is documentation to show that the corporation was continued. Uh, you, you haven't seen them all, but we will provide it to the, the city staff. But it's more than that because the condition because says that, that you're going you're gonna to have to satisfy this, the staff that those corp the owners of record are qualified to do business in the state of California. Okay. Correct. I'm, I, Correct. I'd like to make a suggestion. Uh, since this is not something that we are going to solve, since this is not something that is actually technically before us, I suggest that we move on and let those who are going to be tasked with enforcing and making sure that there is an identifiable and accurate ownership entity. Uh, let them take care of it. Let's right. And we have a condition stick with to the task. Right. Okay. The and there's a condition structure to require right. exactly and it's that. In the, exactly. It, right. May, let me ask the clarification. The number I have that talks about the ownership of subject property on my packet says 81. Is it uh, 81 82 or? is the one that was sent out tonight that notes the addition of a condition right. 35. Okay. That's the addition. And then we number the Does right. one supersede the other, or are they both conditions that will be obeyed? Okay. They're the same condition with different numbering. They changed the number because they added, That's all I needed. They added one. Yes, okay. Yeah, because we it, had the earlier edition. Yes. All the numbers so shift up one. Yeah, yeah got exactly. it. That's, it's and then the with the new condition of waterproofing, we number them again. Okay. I'm with Commissioner Fosberg. So I think, close, in short, we have sufficient conditions to require Mr. Dornfest to solve this problem right. before anything is issued on the ground. Right. Um, so can I suggest it, that we close the public hearing? Well, there was there is, public hearing. There's no public open. hearing. Are, are there any other questions or well, uh, I actually, uh, for Mr. Yeah. Dornfest? Oh, yeah. I don't want to cause trouble, but I do want to ask for a little leeway in making this learning opportunity help me in the future, because I'm, I'm, I'm for 
all the conditions and for the, the approval of the, um, the application with all the conditions that we've talked about. But there are several questions I have and several observations I want to make that will help this applicant and others who come before us. Because are I've those, uh, if I could question, things that comments that could be conveyed after there's an action on the application before the commission? Well, yes and no. Okay, um, I'll give you an example, and then you can tell me whether it's appropriate or not. Um, if we get past the two-year ownership issue, which I did have questions on and is resolved, as far as I can see. Um, This, uh, this application, like many in Calabasas, are in very high fire hazard severity zones. And because of that, we basically create, um, you know, I guess, a, a condition. Um, and one of the things I'm concerned about is that every opportunity that we can get to help people in Calabasas know that there are ways out of the pickle that has been created by the response of the insurance agencies, the companies, the state, and the FAIR plan. Uh, and that is that if you talk to the folks at FAIR plan, um, based upon one of these conditions, which is number 11, um, I'm warning everybody that your, your difficulty in getting insurance to protect your home and your life and your family uh, is going to be very difficult. We've had massive increases in our city and in Hidden Hills. Friends, in fact, over there are saying that their homes have been gone from 5,000 a year to 20,000 a year in one year because of the way that the state and the insurance commissioner and everybody else in the establishment are treating the hazards. So it's not a problem that is yeah, Mr. Saying. Dornfest, but I want to make the point that this is an opportunity for all of us to learn on these almost standard conditions that we now apply, which is you live in a high fire uh, hazard safety zone and you're, in a, you're gonna be in a panic when it comes to looking at your insurance bill this year. Everybody should be. So um, my sympathy is with an applicant that's before us right now, but we are, we're all in the same pickle. My insurance, in fact, went up a bunch and they're telling me I have to also comply with all the you know, state fire and city fire codes before they'll even consider giving me a policy. And they were misinterpreting our policy. They were telling me, as an example, I had to enclose my eaves on my house before they even, even talk to me about renewing my insurance on the second floor. But the, you know, the state law says if you have eaves exposed on the first floor of your house, you have to fix it. And at the same time, they say you also have to remove five feet of all the living material between your house and it. So a learning experience for the folks who are, in fact, looking to get their houses approved tonight. Um, and on that front, the project, once it gets past the other barriers, will have to comply with whatever the most recent fire code is. So that should pick up things like on ease, page ease seven, requirements. On page seven, another learning experience for us on staff, actually, is that B says stacking construction vehicles related to machinery and so forth would be restricted to areas that do not af af adversely affect adjacent residents or schools. How about streets and flood infrastructures in this instance? And that isn't a condition I want. I'm just saying that that's a learning experience for us. How are we going to address <clears throat> you know, the construction materials and trucks and vehicles and so forth that are affecting the streets, particularly in a place like the Highlands or Old Topanga? or the bird streets in Calabasas. So it's an observation, not a condition, because it's already addressed here. Just look more broadly. And I'll note that's also addressed in the special Highlands uh, requirements for a major construction project permit Yeah, that dictates a safety and um, construction staging management type plan be approved. Uh, we've that's done, condition 33. We've done a, an amazingly thorough job here at the staff level in dealing with all these oddball threats that are unique to our community. Each community has those kinds of things. Um, on uh, condition 15, we're talking about uh, avoiding invasive species. If nobody else is having trouble, I am, with gophers and rats and squirrels. And I'm just saying that as you're building your house, 
make sure that you do follow the fire code and the sa safety code and make sure that there aren't any entries to your house for those mammals and, and pests. <laughs> Again, it doesn't need to affect the conditions on, the, on this pr proposal. And the other, uh, on item 16, you know, we have a, 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 a basically, I guess, a policy or a code that says our uh, landscaping shouldn't be any more than 42 inches in height. Most folks would like to have a little more privacy on their property, but at the same time, um, if you want security, you want your house visible so that with the increasing crime circumstances we have in this and many cities now where drive-by folks are looking at your house all the time, you want to make sure that you're able to see them and they you know, are, are not going to be encouraged to try to invade your place. Again, it doesn't change the circumstance, but it's, it's a good thing to obey, and that is to check out the height of your, your, your visible uh, landscaping on the, on the streets. Um, the other, th uh, in condition 20, we've dwelled on your place a lot, but um, there are many places in Calabasas where the watershed maps are very sketchy. No one knows where their drainage goes, yet we're asking them to uh, do all this, um, our, I guess, careful planning to make sure the drainage doesn't go um, to the wrong place or erode the wrong stuff or fill the wrong uh, drainage basins. And we face that with this project. No need to consider additional changing, but it's a learning experience for our community. Figure out where you are in the watershed and what you're going to do with the drainage on your property. I've got about four others, and I'm, I, uh, to your point, Matt, I think what we can do is uh, just pass these along to staff and in the enforcement and or the discussion about the implementation of the, of the approval or the approved project. Um, I would ask that our staff take a look at some of these opportunities. An example, one last one, and that is that we're always careful about geotechnical issues, but uh, our Native American you know, habitat you know, oftentimes turns up really interesting archaeological resources, and not this project, but Calabasas on Mulholland Highway, Old Topanga, Las Virgenes Creek. I mean, we have villages of Native Americans, you know, at Talapop, at Old, Tup I mean, at uh, Las Virgenes Road and Mulholland Highway, uh, that are research opportunities, literally. So, if if in the grading and or the development of a property, uh, uh, we are able to identify that there's a meaningful arche archeological resource, not that they have to go and call somebody from UCLA to come out, but tell the city. They, and, and there are significant state law requirements on a f any, any fine more than a, a yeah, but shard. No, it, it's, it's a good state law. Significant fines trigger a whole process. But it's, it should, and it just might. And again, it doesn't affect anything. The last thing I'm going to talk about is that um, the, the very high mineral content of the water we have in, in, in Calabasas, we have wells in Calabasas. And they're in Old Canyon, and there are springs that are all over, including in the highlands. And uh, Condition 50 talks about soil corrosively you know, shall be analyzed, because that's a condition that you agreed to, to take on. But um, if you haven't figured out what that means, just drive on Mulholland Drive sometime between El Camino Center and Valmar, actually, and, um, and Gelson's on Mulholland Drive. The street's red from the Ferris that's leaking out of the hillsides onto right. Mulholland Drive, and it's for a half a mile. So as you see that you might be literally in that arena where there are um, soil corrosives, essentially. Thank you for you know, agreeing to that condition as well. But it's one that everyone in Calabasas should pay attention to because that's just the nature of our volcanically created mountains here. I'll, I'll pass the rest along to the staff. Absolutely. Staff but, can take, take but, a close look at that. As, as you know, staff works closely with approved project right. builders to make sure that all the conditions are complied with closely. Oh, one last educational thing. On uh, page 18, um, conditions 78 through roughly 80, uh, if you don't know, you can get free discount rain barrels, and you can get free or at least discounted sprinkler controllers for your irrigation system from the Las Virgenes Municipal Water District. 
The fire department will provide you with free sand and sandbags. So if you have to protect, you know, in a major rain event, it's worth your while to know that Station 68, 125 here in Calabasas, they have those resources for you. That's enough. The rest I'll turn in, like I said. <laughs> and thanks for indulging me, and thank you for letting me ride on your train, okay? Thank you, Dennis. Um, I guess we're ready to discuss what to do with this. So I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution number 2023-782 um, with the additional waterproofing condition that Mr. Summers has already um, uh, read. If you, if you need to hear it again, I'm sure you can do that. And I have a, a couple minor nitpits, nitpicks on the resolution which I might as well say what they are now as part of my motion. Go ahead. On page eight, excuse me, page nine of the resolution, exhibit, uh, condition 27, as is grammatical, I think it means to be, say applicants shall be responsible. Completing removal of relocations. Well, I'm gonna to get to that, but applicants shall be responsible as opposed to too responsible, yep. right? Agreed for removals or relocations, and my question was of what? <laughs> uh, what might be removed and what might need to be relocated? Is uh, there a- That's a staff question. <clears throat> I, I, would, I would basically say we're not exactly sure until you start you know, digging, but there could be utilities or something. This is a public works condition, so they'd be able to provide more detail than I could. But I mean, if they encounter a utility line of some kind that has to be reloc relocated, this is saying they're responsible. Uh, how about of, of, ob obstructions, uh, uh, paren, e.g., utilities, or something that would just kind of give a little content to what these words mean? Obstructions, I think, would need it. Obstructions? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, maybe just to add the existing improvements, obstructions. It's, it's, yeah, it's hard to tell. Whatever the final plans. Because that this plans also include the entire street improvements and whatever they uh, might run into when they do that improvement. Are you comfortable with obstructions? Uh, yes, we, we can. Yeah, uh, Mr. Summers su suggests that's the good word for to include everything. Okay. Um, I mean, as opposed to homeless people or something. <laughs> right, yeah, the physical improvements. <laughs> Good point. Ex uh, condition 34, page 10, in the uh, fourth. Just, just, just so mm -hmm. that everybody makes sure they follow you. Sorry to interrupt. Yep. You're referring to the amended resolution, correct? So well, I don't know what I'm looking at. I'm looking at Exhibit A. Of the Am material. Right? Right? Go to the next page. I can tell you what the check's on. Well, just tell us the number of the... Resolution. I haven't got to 35 yet. Oh, is that going to oh. be your new condition? 35 is the one Tom added. So yeah, so we'll, I'm not there yet. So yeah, you're on the, I'm the still version. The, of this, you're on the version of the packet. So we'll note that when we get there. Okay. Keep going. So condition uh, 27 on Exhibit A, page nine. Oh, we've already done that. Uh, excuse me. Condition 34, the last second to the last uh, line of the first sentence is a little messed up. I think. And it says, and geotechnical design parameters. I think it should say for the design of the proposed residential construction. Wait, which one are you on? 34? 34, the fourth line down. Oh, I see. Okay. It just, it's just grammatical. So it should read design parameters for the design of. Or to Agreed. design. Or okay. And or if I may, we'd just say, because the design's already in there. Geotechnical design parameters for the get rid of design oh, okay. the second time. All right. Does that work? That's fine. Yeah. Um, now I'll let Matt worry about the number of the condition. On my packet, Exhibit A, page 16, uh, condition 70 that starts this project as a development planning priority uh, project under the NPDES. That's 70. About yeah. 70, yeah, about four lines down, it says, must be prepared. So this, uh, an urban stormwater mitigation plan must be prepared, okay? It doesn't say by whom. I assume that's by the applicant. 
we have above in 69 uh, a phrase that says applicant comma or the owner slash owner's agent and that's fine so shouldn't we say that here it must be prepared by the applicant comma or the owner owner's agent that'd be fine otherwise i don't know who's going to prepare this stuff um, same issue with uh, set paragraph excuse me condition 71 that starts out provide adequate filtration the start of that should be applicant comma or the owner slash owner's agent comma shall provide okay just makes it clear that it's the applicant and not the city who's going to do all that stuff is that right agreed okay uh, that's it so with those corrections with the uh, condition new condition number so there's two new conditions uh, from that one one is 35 which was added in the packet I'll just read it short no grading or other construction permit may be issued until a signed letter of authorization is provided by the owner of the adjoining property 3460 lilac trail APN 2072011006 allowing for off-site grading on that property in association with the project. And the second new condition, the waterproofing condition read earlier, uh, applicants shall have a waterproofing plan prepared by a licensed contractor with waterproofing expertise submitted to the city engineer for approval before issuance of any grading or building permit and shall implement the waterproofing plan as approved to the satisfaction of the city engineer. Thank you. Let me ask you a question, of Matt, if I may. Um, on page nine, uh, condition 22, uh, applicants shall notify off-site residential uses located within 500 feet of the project with such notice, that's the 500 feet of, I guess, 500 feet of the project to owners. Uh, did we ever use to notify the HOA of these kinds of things, and have we done that? Uh, his Historically, I think the HOA is often given notice. I don't want to say always given notice because always I'm not, I don't have the facts at my fingertips for always. I will note here there is no HOA to give notice to. Is that a fact? The Highlands has no HOA. They stopped. So That's they're, yeah. So here it wouldn't, it I wouldn't apply. Another I think thing, historically thank you very it's much. picked up. Because <laughs> we used to deal used to. directly when there was a major, major, major threat to the entire you know highlands community back in the early days of the city yeah there, there's i'm not, not going a there legal I, hoa there's a uh there's a community association but it's not it's a, the, it's a voluntary it's HOA. a voluntary it's hoa a voluntary. Okay. so there is an hoa it's voluntary and but other, it's not a legal hoa wasn't there a gentle a, a witness who said he was the president of something yes of I an hoa so. i thought yeah, yeah. I so see, I, think, I did I, listen to the tape. I think there is. It's just a voluntary HOA. So I think it is legal map, it's just voluntary. Right, but it's not a deed restricted, it's not a deed no. HOA. Right. And the, the other question is, um, do we recommend electrical equipment um, in lieu of uh, gas driven with exhaust mufflers and so forth, like as in uh, you know, condition number 23? because it says all power construction equipment shall be equipped with exhaust mufflers or other suitable noise reduction devices. The real key is spark arresters because we've started fires in this community with power equipment in the past on even city land, which is kind of odd. Now that's not in the condition and I'm not suggesting it necessarily. Yeah, I, was, I don't think the council's yet adopted a requirement for electric only construction equipment. I think okay. that'd have to be a bigger policy discussion. What about the spark arrester? I think the spark arresters are already required by the fire code. Okay. I hope so. Um, that, I think that's the only other question from a legal standpoint. Thanks. Was there a second? Is there a second for I'll that? second it. All right. Let's, uh, any comments from anybody? I have a few comments, but I don't know if anybody else does. Go for it. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm concerned about a couple of things. One is the hydrology, and I don't know if our staff has looked into this. Um, when th this street is not a street, it's a you know a dirt path, and uh, and it's going to be paved. So once it's paved, uh, um, and engineers sometimes forget this, the water that goes down this street and it's a seasonal stream basically uh, will accelerate and won't soak into the ground. So I'm hoping that our staff will look at that. That the existing hydrology reports really need to be 
looked at carefully. Um, I mean, when, when, when the Army Corps of Engineers straightened out the, the, the Mississippi and, and, and uh, they um, ended up, uh, you know, took out all the oxbow curves and so forth, it ended up accelerating the flow. And so when it does flood, it actually is worse than it was before. So um, uh, anyway, so that's one concern. Um, the fire insurance, Dennis makes a, uh, th this is something for all of us, not just this applicant, but I know someone whose insurance was um, not renewed because the insurer moved out of the state. And there are no insurance companies right now that I know of who are writing policies, <coughs> new, new policies. They, they just aren't. And, and the only quote that person could get was for $43,000 a year. For, for, for go to the fair plan. So they have to go to the fair plan, right. But you should. Right. At least ask them questions and they'll right. be happy to advise right. you. Right. So, it, so it's not just you, but it's everybody. We're all in a tough situation here until this gets straightened out. Um, as far as I'm still concerned about the water, I'm, more, I, I'm less concerned that you're, that you're getting a, um, a special, you know, uh, a contractor who specializes in, in, um, in that, in water, in waterproofing. Um, uh, and this, then, this is for us to discuss, and, and we're, we're going to vote on this or not. Yeah, no, I'm just saying my concerns, mm -hmm. and then we can vote. Okay. Uh, but I'm concerned about that. Uh, uh, try to install a bladder or something to keep the, any roots from, from going that direction. And then the, um, the title, as far as the title goes, I hope staff in the future doesn't take an application with an, uh, with where, where, the, where there's the title is not clear because it's like a theoretical, you spending a lot of time and then the owner now has to spend probably months to get this straightened out and that eats into the, to the period. And um, I mean, a lot of work has been done and it's, you know, it's to date, it's theoretical, you know, and so, so. Um, Staff has assessed how to avoid that in the future. Okay, good. So, cause that's not good for anybody really. I mean, you know, so anyway, with that, um, Unless there are other comments, we can take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And all those opposed now. So it's all, it's uh, unanimous then. Um, thank you. We're gonna move on, but I'll make one last freebie. And that <laughs> is if you want soil compost, as much as you can possibly carry, you can get for free from the Las Virgenes Municipal oh, Water District. And true. you can get free access to thousands of gallons, if you want it, of reclaim water in order to deal with your gardening and everything else. So uh, pay attention to the free stuff. We've been working on a bunch of us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. By the way, um, just for the uh, communication staff up there, uh, or the, uh, we don't have any, uh, our, none of our computers are on. And I don't know if that's going to be an issue because we have a couple of reports coming up. So, um, I just thought I, I think they'll turn them on once we're ready I, for yeah, a we'll PowerPoint see. presentation. Oh, okay. All right. I, so, yeah, I think there wasn't a PowerPoint so the, before. So the next item, item three, is file number SPR 2023-008. It's a request for a site plan review to build a 945-square-foot addition to an existing two-story residence located at 4051 Magna Carta Road within the residential single-family. Oh, there it is, Fiat Luke's. Okay. Uh, RS Zoning District. It's submitted by Barbara Paderni, the designer. Um, but first, maybe we have a report from Jacqueline Rackerby. Yes. And then, we can op then we'll open the public hearing. And I don't think I have any cards on this, but um, OK. Yes. Thank you. Go Thank ahead, you. Jacqueline. Thank you, Chair Harrison. I, I just want to clarify, you can see the PowerPoint on your screens now, right? Yes, now we can, yes. OK, great. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. First, I want to mention this project was noticed to all property owners within 500 feet of the subject site. It was also um, posted throughout the city at all required locations and on the city's website. Staff has not received any public correspondence regarding the project. So here we can see an overview of the subject site. It's located to the north of Mulholland Highway within the residential single family zoning district and the greater Molewood community. The site is surrounded to the north, south, east, and west by other single-family residences. And then a little bit further to the south, you can see the elementary school in this photo. It's a little bit more of a close-up view of the subject site. 
It's a 0.38 acre uh, interior lot of 16,579 square feet. The site is currently developed with an existing split level single family residence of approximately 2,400 square feet, as well as improvements such as an attached garage, landscape, hardscape, and a pool in the rear yard. So here we have two photos of the subject site. The one on the left is the site as viewed from the street, so looking to the west. Um, and then the photo in the bottom right corner is a little bit more of a close-up view of the site. Um, in the close-up view on the right-hand corner, this is the area of work in the front yard where the addition will be located. You can see from the photos of this residence that it's a bit of a mid-century architectural style. And then I'll note on this image that that um, front portion of the residence on the second story is cantilevered forward a little bit over the first floor. And then you can also see the grade differential, differential in this image. Um, so again, it's a split level residence. The garage is at a little bit higher grade level than the portion of the first floor that's on the left hand side of the image. You can also see the landscaped courtyard area in the photo of on the left hand side. So the proposal before you tonight is for construction of a 676 square foot addition to the first floor and a 269 square foot addition to the second floor of an existing split level single family residence and Calabasas Municipal Code Section 17.62.020 requires this project to be reviewed by the Planning Commission. So here we have the proposed site plan. Um, you can see in gray here, let me see my cursor on the screen, um, in gray here the existing single family residence and then the area of addition at the first floor is shown in yellow. The area of addition at the second floor is shown in blue. So the first floor is being extended towards the front property line by approximately 18 feet. And then the second floor, which currently cantilevers out over the first floor, is being extended by about um, 12 feet and four inches towards the front. So the residence is essentially being pulled forward a little bit. And then that existing walled courtyard that you had seen in that image of the front of the house currently is also being um, pulled forward. So it'll be about even with the garage um, following the completion of the proposed project. Uh, there's also a new deck proposed at the rear that you can see in this image as well. Are you using your cursor to show these things? You, are, are, are you able to see my cursor on the screen? No. Well, I'll, de I'll describe it verbally then. Oh. <laughs> well, it's okay. I, did, I, just, I, did, I was just commenting because I, I haven't seen you a cursor. You can't see move. anything? Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll describe it verbally. Okay. On the proposed first floor plan, um, you can see the area of addition outlined or shown in yellow here. As mentioned, they're essentially just um, dragging that first floor out towards the, towards the front. So that's the area of 600 square foot addition there. I also want to note that they are doing a small area of garage conversion. The garage currently is longer than 20 feet in length. And so with that small area of conversion that you can see in the garage, the garage will conform with the um, 20 by 20 minimum requirement even with that small conversion. And then on the proposed second floor plan, you can see in blue the area where the second floor is going to be enlarged, dragging that towards the front as well. Here we have the proposed elevations. You can see from the proposed east elevation, which is the front of the house, it will look very similar to the previous photo that I had showed of the front of the residence, because again, they're dragging the existing home forward, um, keeping the same kind of architectural style, keeping the same roof pitch. Um, you can see that they're keeping the same kind of clear story windows that they have. Um, and then we have the proposed west elevation, which is the home as viewed from the rear. You can see that new deck in this photo. And then we have the proposed south elevation and proposed north elevation, which are the homes as viewed from the side. Um, the proposed south elevation, you can really see the area of addition in this photo. It's shaded with the little bit of darker texture is the area that's going to be new. And then in the proposed north elevation, this is the garage in the foreground. So in the background, you can see the area of new roof farther in the distance. Then we have a colors and materials board. The residence uh, is going to be painted in the color China Doll by Sherwin-Williams. So that's going to be the color for the stucco and for the trim. And then the garage is going to be painted black. And then as noted on this sheet, the uh, new all the windows are going to be replaced and they're going to be replaced with new black uh, frame windows. So the architecture review panel reviewed the proposed project on October 27th, 2023. 
Uh, the subject site is not within a designated scenic corridor and there are no architectural design standards applicable to the property. The ARP found that the proposed project is compatible with the aesthetics of the surrounding neighborhood and they recommended approval of the project to the Planning Commission. I do want to mention that the ARP did have suggestions regarding articulation of the second floor and providing some differentiation between the first and second floor, um, which I'll describe on this slide, just to describe it kind of visually. So in this image on, on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, one of the ARP suggestions was to cantilever the second floor. So they had asked the applicant to pull the second floor forward so that it cantilevers out over the first floor. Um, very similar to what you saw of the photos of the existing residents, so kind of keeping that same design element. The problem with that is, as you can see in the image on the left, the property line is not parallel to the residents. So with the new addition, their side setback is 10 feet exactly. The minimum side yard setback for the RS zoning district is 10 feet. So if they did take ARP's suggestion to pull that second floor forward, they would have been pulling it into the setback area. So as a way to address that comment, but still meet our minimum setback, if you look at the image on the top right, that's a um, screen cap of the second floor plan. So essentially what they're doing is kind of a faux cantilever. So they have these walls that project out on either side of the second floor. And then if you look at the image on the bottom right, you can see when viewed from the side, those wing walls project further out. So when viewed from the side, it gives the look of a cantilever, but it still meets the side, um, side yard setback requirements. So that way it's not within that side yard setback area. Okay, moving on to a home size comparison. So home sizes in the vicinity range from 1,763 square feet to 4,042 square feet. And the lot sizes in the vicinity range from approximately 8,521 square feet to 16,773 square feet. The average home size in the vicinity is 2,502 square feet and the average lot size is 11,439 square feet. So with a proposed project, the residence will be 3,345 square feet in total, and the lot size is 16,731 square feet. So essentially, the size of the proposed residence will be above the average, but within the range of home sizes in the area, and the lot size is also um, larger than the average lot size in the area as well. Um, and this data is based on the, is, comes from the home comparison table within the staff report, which looks at all homes within a 300 foot radius of the subject site. And the surrounding homes are a mix of one and two story single family residences. So there are six applicable findings for a site plan review that come from section 17.62.020 of the Calabasas Municipal Code. The applicant has provided their responses for their proposed findings to make a uh, site plan review permit. And those findings from the applicant are included in your packets as exhibit B. So with that, staff concludes that the proposed project will not alter the existing use of the subject site, which is an allowed use in the RS zoning district. Compliance with the applicable development standards is documented within the written staff report. The existing residence is considered legal non-conforming due to the north side setback, but they are not proposing to touch that or alter that as part of this project, so no variance permit is required. Homes in the neighborhood range in size from 1,763 square feet to 4,042 square feet. With the proposed additions, the residence will be 3,345 square feet. And the architecture review panel recommended approval of the project with suggestions which the applicant has revised the plans to incorporate. And the project is exempt from CEQA review pursuant to section 15061, a general rule exemption, and 15301, existing facilities of the California CEQA guidelines. So staff recommends that the commission direct staff to prepare a resolution for approval or resolution for denial of file number SPR-2023-008, inclusive of all required findings to support the resolution. Uh, thank you, and I'm available for questions. We do also have the applicant and the property owner here tonight. Uh, I don't believe that they wish to make a presentation, but they're available for questions if the commission has any. I think after the last uh, item, they probably don't want <laughs> don't want to come up. <laughs> but, um, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Uh, are there any questions? For I have. Oh, go ahead. I just I mean, this is about as straightforward as they come, as far as I'm concerned. However, I do have one question, and that is, uh, have you heard from any of the neighbors? We have not. Okay. 
that's it for me. Yes. I have a question. Tonight is an educational meeting for me. Thank you very much. Um, on uh, page, uh, page 13 of the packet and the display, if you go back to that page 13 diagram, that's where we show the 10-foot setback oh. there. Um, why do we, in this instance, protect the setback regulation um, to the point of literally creating an obstacle for what the applicant was looking for um, in terms of extending the building and or the, you know, conforming to the garage extension to the front. That circled area that says um, the north setback is 10 feet. If it weren't 10 feet, if it was eight feet, would they have designed the house differently or the, 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 the request differently? So they do have farther than a 10 foot setback on that side currently. I, um, I don't have the existing site plan in front of me, but it is a little bit farther than that currently. Uh -huh. Since they're bringing the corner of the first floor out to be exactly 10 feet, they just can't project the second floor any farther than that. Otherwise, sure. it would be closer than the 10 feet. Well, and, and what's the hazard of that? Is it uh, like fire access? You know, fire, uh, public safety access of some kind? I or? believe the fire department requires five feet, but for our um, residential single family zoning district setback, we require 10 feet minimum. I don't believe they have a legal nonconformity on that side, so that's why they, they can't make it any, any worse than the conforming setback they have currently. I do understand that, but my question is more fundamental. It's like, why do we set that tight a rule in this type of a, a developed area? I think that's that just may, the code. Yeah, that, that may be more no, of a question I, for the, the commission than staff. Why did the code staff? get set that way? I'm well, asking that question. Oh, well, you were on the council, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, it, it isn't that. I mean, uh, there's a rationale, and I'm not complaining about it. I'm just trying to understand. Um, if I may, I mean, the 10-foot side yard setbacks that are applicable to the RS zone, um, not to say that this is the answer, it's one of the answers I can't stand to hear from somebody else, but it's always been that way, right? <laughs> Okay. Uh, it was on the books before I started 20 sure. years ago here, and it's not an atypical setback for single-family zoning districts um, throughout California, well, to we've be honest. Had, yeah, I mean, not this project, but there have been instances in my career here where people have really pushed their setbacks, you know, in fractions, I guess you would call it, by pushing the envelope to get more space for the house or, you know, more space for the, uh, and closer adjacency to the neighboring properties, whether, whether they're residential or commercial for that matter. Maybe that's the reason, but I'm just trying to get a sense out of why did we set the setbacks in a, this, I'm sure this is an R1 zone, because I live in Mulwood like this is, and you know we have an R1 zoning, and it started out when the county zoned everything out here in Calabasas, A1 agricultural one unit to the acre <laughs> and everybody played with what happens with you know do I want three to with the acre or now we're pushing 10 and 12 to the acre in terms of um, residential you know properties and my guess is that the setbacks are trying to uh, a means of discouraging that and also probably providing a public safety access for meter readers for fire su support for you know, well, whatever. My sense between, is much of it is a fire a safety between, component. I'm sorry? My sense is much of it is a fire safety component. Uh, the county minimum is five feet clear to the sky around all properties. Uh, you stack five feet, you get 10. If you go beyond that, you, two tens is 20 feet right. minimum. I think the intention was fire safety, but that's... And, and probably to have a nice suburb or something. Right, and I to mean, preserve so, a more suburban, yeah. less walled off, all, all housing type. Sure. Environment, but that's uh, the wisdom of our of our forebears. Okay. And our current. Again, it isn't a complaint. I'm just trying to figure out why these things exist, and sometimes it's good to ask the question just so everybody knows why we have to do the things we do up here, and that's enforce, you know, literally a process where design review is required, or CUP is required. Anyway, on we go. Thank okay. you. Um, I want to thank the designer for your thoughtful um, additions. And are there any other comments, or are we ready for a motion? Um, I don't know if you've conducted the hearing. I'm sorry, but oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I can open it. Suggest it cards? There's no cards. 
So there's no one who wishes to speak. Um, any any motion? I'll, I'll move uh, approval of file number SPR 2023-008 and uh, that we direct staff to prepare a resolution for approval. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? No? All those in favor? Aye. 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 So it's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you for your design and thank you for coming in. Uh, so now, and thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, and now we move on to item four, which is a uh, file number VAR variance 2023-003 request for a variance to allow for a 247 square foot addition to the west side of an existing single family residence located at, and I can't pronounce it, it's Dutch, uh, maybe your son can, uh, 4041 Schuylkill or Skykill Drive. The residence is currently non-conforming. Uh, and this is what we were just talking about, actually, Jacqueline. Uh, it's non-conforming. Oh, it's another card for this item. Okay, thanks. Non-conforming um, side setback. It's not conforming to the 10-foot side setback allowance on the west side of the property. And the request here is to allow for a seven-foot side setback to expand the first-level kitchen. It's submitted by the owners, James and Sandra Mee. And um, first, I guess we can have a report from Angela. And then, then we'll open the public hearing because there are several people who wish to speak. Thank you, Chair Harrison. Thank you. Um, good evening, Commissioners. I'd like to start by mentioning that this project was noticed to all of the property owners within 500 feet, and the notice was posted on the website and throughout the city at all required locations. Uh, staff has received one comment from a neighbor, um, which is in support of the project. And there are additional letters of support that were provided by the applicant, which were included in the exhibits with the staff report. I did just want to note one correction on the staff report, if you don't mind. On um, page two, under background, section B, have a little typo where I meant to add in the approximately 19 square feet. So if you could just note that. So I apologize for that error. What was that number? 19. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, just so that um, everyone gets their bearings, this is sort of an overview of the greater Mulwood area where the project site is located. Um, so you can see here it's just north of Mulholland Highway and then just um, northwest of the Calabasas High School. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for interrupting, but are you looking at something or are you just telling yeah. us? Yeah. Oh, is it not coming up? It's not, it's oh. not clicking the next slide. Oh, it's on my screen. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt, but. We see the slides, but just the first slide, the title slide. We don't see the next slides. While we're waiting. It's a tomato tomato issue. It's sky kill if you're in the east, or it's school kill if you're up on the street. And even those folks will give you a discussion on what it's really called. I've only heard <laughs> it called school kill. I think it's school kill in, uh, in uh, New York. It, if you're Dutch. If you're Dutch. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that, it's, it, yeah. Wasn't that prominent in um, Hamilton? Oh, I haven't seen that, but it's definitely yeah, it's, uh, a common name back east. It's, yeah, yeah. Like it's a river. It's, it's a, a river. river. Yeah. yeah. In Pennsylvania, yeah. maybe, yeah. or somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, upstate New York. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The school kill. IBM is up there. Sorry, we're having technical difficulty here. Maybe we can get Okay. <laughs> but your your son would would say for the SDH because. <laughs> Like they say, school, school, because they s pronounce it. The uh, it, so ga gosh, I don't, I don't have a lot any of guttural. kilo or something. I have no idea in Dutch <laughs> <laughs> what it is. So what do we say though? School kill, sky kill. We have another beer. Oh, <laughs> all right. Maybe we can ask perhaps Mr. Me how he pronounces maybe it. Maybe we could. Perhaps uh, the chair would invite fellow commissioners to agree on taking a break for a little bit and we'll try to get this technical problem solved. Is oh, okay? is that all right? Sure. All right, so we'll take a short Perfect. Uh, technical Thank so break. <laughs> Thank you. Up to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Angela, it's 
You have the floor. Thank you so much for your patience during our technical difficulties. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the slide that I was originally um, speaking at, which is the um, aerial overview. Um, this is the greater Mulwood area, and it's pointing to where the project site is located. Um, and as I was stating earlier, it's just located north of Mulholland Highway and northwest of Calabasas High School. This is a more close-up um, version of the parcel itself. And as you can see here, the location map shows the um, pie-shaped parcel shape, which we will be covering a little bit more in the presentation. So the project description as was um, read in the record by um, Chair Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, this is just an overview of that, which is the request to allow um, for a seven-foot side setback to expand the first level kitchen. And then this is just um, a couple of 3D um, view pictures from Google Maps. It's obviously not the best quality on Google Maps um, looking this way, but you can kind of see how the um, house is um, shaped on the parcel, and you can see that side setback that we are talking about um, and why we are here for the variance. I'm just going to ask a quick question. D sure. Have you tried the mouse to see if the arrow shows up on this screen? Yeah, it, it does work. Okay, great. So, yeah, no, it oh. that. So um, these photographs were actually supplied by the applicants themselves. Thank you very much. Um, and this shows this back section, which we will be discussing a little bit more um, for the um, seven foot setback for the variance. And as you can see here in the photo, let's see, can you see my cursor here? Um, you can see in this photo that the second story um, cantilever is just above the first floor. And we'll be kind of discussing that just a little bit more in some of the following diagrams. Okay, this is um, a close-up of the site plan. So I just want you to really note um, the shape of the parcel itself. So you can see that pie um, shape. And then if you can notice, let me get my mouse here. In this section here, I know this is kind of a little bit hard to see, but I just want you to see um, how it's running parallel with the property line where the proposed development is for the addition on the kitchen. So it's proposing to extend the existing seven foot side setback. So I just want to note that before we get to a close up. And then also just to keep in mind um, something else that I want to note, this is um, an addition which is relatively small and it's sort of a three part addition. The total square footage is 297 square feet. So without this um, proposed seven foot side setback, this would be processed with a zoning clearance. Um, so it would have done, been done ministerially, so it wouldn't have been anything that would have actually went to a public hearing. The only reason that we're here today is because of this, um, the variance for the seven foot side setback. Okay, and now we get into a little bit of a colorful picture. And I want to try to set up and describe this. Um, you know, as you all know, I came from a different jurisdiction. So this was something that I had to sort of get used to with the non-conforming side setbacks. And it is a little bit confusing, maybe to the layman. Um, and commissioners, you may be more familiar, but maybe with people in the audience, they may be a little confused um, how this, um, this regulation um, comes into play and why we're sort of here today with this, you know, you see that it's an existing seven foot side setback on this residence and they're looking to just continue it. But I just want to explain why we're here and why um, the applicant is asking for a variance and why it falls into this regulation. So um, if you see here in the, the turquoise area, use my little mouse to point. So this is existing. So this is the first floor existing area that's within that now it's 10 foot setback. Prior, you know, years ago when it was under LA County and it was constructed, it was a five foot setback, okay? So this is already existing here and they want to extend that addition. And what our regulation states, I, I could read the lengthy section if anyone needs me to, but it's section 17.72.0020. I'll just try to summarize it, which is that as long as you're not extending more than the 50% of existing, then you can continue it, right? So this is what they're sort of showing here with the grid. So if you see this other grid area and the darker blue right here, this is to illustrate this is what they're allowed to do to extend with that 50%. However, with the design of the kitchen that the applicant is requesting, they really want to extend further in order to get the full max use of their, of their kitchen. And I'll show you the floor plan as well so you can kind of see the layout. Um, but I just want to point that out and why we're here for the variance and what that portion is. So this portion here is just under 13 square feet. So this is the portion of the addition that why we are here today for the variance. 
So you can see a little bit better here on the floor plan. Um, I think the applicant is really wanting to utilize, like I was stating, utilize that kitchen area and extend that. And so visually, this made more sense because the second floor, like I did mention earlier, does cantilever over the first floor and already does extend out this way. So the applicant um, is requesting for the variance in order to extend the kitchen in this particular layout. And then you can see here as well um, that the addition that would be part of a zoning clearance is also mentioned here too, which is to um, add on a closet and a bathroom on the first floor bedroom. And um, I'm sure you've read these in your, in your packets and you're probably all very familiar with the variance findings. Um, I just want to point out that these are the findings. I'm not going to bore you with reading them all. Um, but um, when it comes to a variance, all five of the findings do need to be met in order to um, recommend an approval. And um, our applicants have provided a set of findings which has been included with your exhibits. I'm sure that you've had a chance to review them. And um, move on to this section. And so um, based on this, we are asking the Planning Commission to look at the, require, um, to look at the required findings, um, look at the pertinent facts of this um, project, look at staff's analysis, and then also take into account um, the public hearing testimony. And then the Planning Commission may reasonably determine that the requested variance is either um, approved or denied. Uh, this project is exempt from CEQA review. And staff is available to answer any questions, but um, the applicant team has requested to um, present on their behalf as well, and we have Christina Kropp, who is the um, owner's attorney, who would like to present, and then James Mee, um, who is a property owner, along with his wife, um, he would like to present as well. And then, as I mentioned, um, the recommended action is that the commission directs staff to either prepare a resolution of approval or a resolution of denial um, for file number um, VAR 2023-003. And also, like I mentioned, it would be um, approved as a zoning clearance without the variance. So the zoning clearance is um, here as well, which is the ZCL-2023-083 and inclusive of all required findings to support the resolution. And once again, um, I'm here to um, answer any questions um, and we are prepared to assist the commission in developing whatever findings you see fit. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And thank you for all the work uh, you've done. Um, so now, uh, this one, I we do have a uh, card, so I will open the public hearing. And, uh, and may, then, may I ask one question of staff oh, first? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Just I'm sorry. Real go quick, ahead. if, if yeah. uh, Ms. George F., if you could go back to the um, three colored non conforming setback, that no one. Problem. So did I understand you correctly that the, the, the variance application is really for the upper blue? Yeah, this top section right here. In, in other words, and if they were not going to do that, they would be here Yeah, if they tonight. were just going up to here where this grid line is, okay. then it would be within that 50%, and so it would be processed with a zoning clearance. And if you were to um, take this, geometrical shape and put it onto the proposed floor plan where's the top of the blue I'm talking about the next page is proposed floor plan mm -hmm. and I know you can't literally do it but the, the the blue portion that is the variance portion where if, with your cursor show me where that is on the proposed floor plan to the upper left I there think it's about here I'm just guesstimating and the applicants may have a better representation. Well, that's, that's the turquoise, but the blue is farther up. Yeah, the, blue, the blue is blue just is the, Yeah, this part. That is, part, okay. Yeah. So, so I'm just trying to see where, what the existing uh, line is. I realize this is an extension. Right, there's an extension. A, there's a set of dash double lines. Yeah, the, that you the see. white is yes. the existing, and then the gray is the proposed. The dash red double line? Yeah, do you see where it, right? Hold on, let me get my cursor up here. So this, all this gray is proposed oh, on yes, the first yes, floor. Yes. This is all first floor, and then this over here is first floor. This is all existing, the white. And, it, and if you look to the far left, that far left line is the 10-foot setback line, I think. Yeah. And that's why there's a problem here, or that's why there's an issue, let's put it that's that way. That's why the variance uh, is requested, because yeah. it does go <laughs> over that 50%. 
allowance no. for the nonconformity. Yes. Thank you. That explains it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, or can we just go to the public hearing? No, I'd like to hear the speakers. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Mead, do you want to go first, or I, I, or is I don't know. Is Mr. is is the designer here? Okay, because you're not Michael Francis, or you don't look like him. <laughs> I, you could be. There was uh, Michael Learned on the on the uh, Waltons, I think it was. Or, anyway, go ahead. Why don't you state your name and then sure. uh, and what city you're from? Uh, good evening, commissioners. Christina Crop of uh, Luna and Glushan uh, Encino. Um, here on behalf of the homeowners of the property, uh, Jim and Sandra Me. We're also here. Jim would like to say a couple words after me. Uh, the reason we are before you today is because our clients would like to add this very modest 297 square foot addition um, to their home, primarily their kitchen, in the back of the existing home. They cannot do so um, following the current lines, uh, walls of the home um, due to the odd shape of their property, the pie shape of their lot, and that the currently existing home was built under County of Los Angeles requirements um, within approximately uh, existing seven foot side yard. Um, our architect, I'm sorry, had a scheduling issue, so he could not be here today. He submitted a letter. I hope you saw that in our file. Um, but he, as he's told me to tell you, um, the only architecturally correct manner to propose this addition is to design a kitchen that follows the continuation of the existing west wall. This proposed addition maintains the existing legal non-conforming setback of the existing home. It just doesn't meet the extended 10-foot setback of today's code. Um, if we were to try to meet the extended 10-foot side yard setback, um, as you saw in our architect's letter, it would cause a physical three-foot jog in the kitchen, in the kitchen counters. It would eliminate the, the ability to have an island. It would push the kitchen into the family room. Um, it would be architecturally incorrect. It would be functionally incorrect. It would not look professionally designed. Um, before I get into the findings, I, I want to impress on this commission, and we have some of the neighbors here today to also speak in support. This addition and this proposed project is causing zero impacts on the surrounding community. It's not visible from the street. All of the neighbors supported. The Mies have gone around and asked if anybody has had any concerns. Um, the immediately Western neighbors here, he'll speak in support. Um, presumably, the impacts would be on his property, on his privacy, and, and he, has no, he supports the project. Um, and so to us, this de minimis addition, under the circumstances, fits squarely um, within the four corners for the requirements of a variance. I mean, there are special circumstances applicable to this property that do not generally apply to other properties in the same zoning district. The pie shape of the property, the existence of the legal non-conforming home, which has a seven-foot setback, not a two-foot setback, and we're just asking to extend that setback a little bit. Um, and we think that the variance is necessary to protect the Mies property rights. You know, the intent of the zoning regulations, which were not written in a blanket manner, didn't take into account every possibility, every oddly shaped lot. Um, but the intent of them is not to deny property owners the right to reasonably add to their properties, um, to improve their properties. Um, you know, the immediately next door neighbors in 2005, because they have a square lot or a rectangle shaped lot, were able to construct a, a recreation room fully within the current 10 foot setback, extending their own legal non conforming setback without a variance, simply because their property line ran straight um, and ours doesn't. Um, so, this is not a special privilege we're seeking. We're simply seeking the same ability as, as some of our neighbors to improve the property, including the example I gave you, um, just to improve the home, to increase the size of this kitchen without jogging the wall, um, without creating a, a functionally, <laughs> architecturally incorrect structure. Um, you know, the home is located in the RS district. 
It has a corresponding land use of residential single family, which under the code is intended for detached single family homes, um, similar and related compatible uses, quiet family living environment. And this is what it is, and this is what it will remain, um, even with the addition. It will be compatible with all the neighbors, and you only have to look to the neighbor's support for that evidence. So to us, this project has essentially, as I said, zero impacts. It will not be detrimental to the public health or safety or welfare, uh, to the improvements in the vicinity, to the zoning district. And so we ask that you grant the variance based on these findings um, to allow this modest addition. And just because of the conversation that was had, I wanted to point out the size of the addition that we can build is limited to what is currently non-conforming on the property, right? So if, if our non-conforming area was bigger, we would be allowed a bigger addition. It's the fact that the non-conforming area is so small that we're limited in what we can add. But we can't just add, you know, a, a tiny amount of square feet to extend to a 2023 kitchen that's functional for today's family living. Um, this is a very modest addition based on architectural best practices. And um, I'll let Jim put in a few words, but we ask that you grant this variance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, James, me, and we don't seem to have any timers tonight, but um, so James, me. Okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, we pronounced the street school kill drive. And uh, my wife and I, because we had families, we have uh, family members that live in Pennsylvania. We went back there for a week and toured. And the minute that we got there, we got into an Uber and we told the Uber driver, take us to the school kill river. And he said, oh, you mean the Schuylkill river. Schuylkill. So that's how they pronounce it back there. Right. And we have, we took a picture, we took him, he took us to the Schuylkill River, a scenic spot of it, and we took a picture together and we blew it up and it's in our, in our entry so that when people come in, they go, where'd you get this name? You can say, it's right there, there's the river. That's what it's named after. So, okay, so uh, first of all, uh, I'm a sensitive kind of person, sorry. Ugh. My wife and I have lived in this house 29 years. When I bought this house, uh, I saw the cantilever on the back of the house. Uh, I have 16 years of experience in construction before I became an LA County Deputy Sheriff for 33 years. I spent 18 years patrolling this neighborhood. I found this house. Well, I worked in this neighborhood as a deputy sheriff, and it was our dream home, except for that candle beaver. And I said to my wife and the realtor when we bought this house, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen, and that's the easiest addition to this house. And we have been waiting 29 years to afford to do this. I recently retired, and I'm spending much of my retirement money. We paid off the house to pay for this addition. And instead of paying for this addition, I am mired in thousands of dollars and time in trying to get this thing moving, okay? Uh, I, was gonna, I was gonna go for the sympathy vote uh, from you guys, and I was gonna bring my father-in-law who lives in that room and that bedroom on the first floor. He's 97 years old. Uh, last night he fell and he's in the hospital. So this is my father-in-law that uh, uh, wasn't able to be here because he's in the hospital. He's told us that he's, he's uh, committed to staying alive to see this project completed. And if it hadn't been for this little minuscule encroachment, this house would have been, this addition would have been finished, okay? Uh, I have my neighbors that are here that may, may be able to speak, Norm Goodkin. He lives on the side of the proper, my property. We share that property line uh, where the encroachment is, and he's in full support. And he could probably tell you about his addition that he did 
many years ago on the opposite side of his house that parallels. He has a 20 plus foot deep addition that's in the encroachment area and he had no problems. I'm trying to add six feet onto the back of, onto that encroachment area. He had 22 feet, no problems. I have six feet and I'm mired in trying to get this encroachment thing uh, approved. Uh, and that's where the topography of my, if, you, if I'm saying it correctly, the triangular shape of my lot, I'm being penalized for that, which is not fair. Now, I don't think anybody here, uh, Angela is a nice lady, uh, and I don't want to get her, I, I don't want to upset her, I don't want to upset anybody, hmm. uh, and uh, my representative that's helping me with this, uh, they didn't, uh, in, the, in the colored picture that they gave you, trying to explain the encroachment issue, uh, it wasn't, I don't believe, it was explained understandably to you uh, because that was not the correct picture to be showing. I have the correct picture here, it's in black and white, uh, and it gives a better explanation to what the encroachment issue is. Uh, I could also refer you in my explanation to the uh, photos in our exhibits that were, uh, should have been given to you. Uh, we've got uh, uh, photos of the house that were shown, uh, which uh, Angela showed, which are correct photos, okay? But I would show you, I would refer you to those pictures because what this, uh, explanation. This was done by uh, Angela. Uh, what's her name? Carolyn Gross. Okay. I've had three planners on this project, uh, which have also caused delays uh, because the first planner went uh, when she was assigned my case or my or my project uh, went on sick leave, as I understood it and they had an associate planner, which was Carolyn Groves, take her place for a short time. And when she came back with an incomplete notice that I couldn't do this project the way it was designed, and I went and had questions, then I got assigned another person who then, gave, uh, I ended up with Angela, okay? And then because I kept having to go back there and ask questions, Angela, I believe, became fearful of me and wouldn't talk to me unless her supervisor was there, who then got annoyed with me saying, Why, I've talked to you about this before, why do you keep coming back? Okay, so this has been the issue here, is that, is that the cantilever on the house, the second floor overlaps the first floor. If you measure the corner of the house, okay, if you look up there in that picture and you measure the corner of the house where the second floor wall is, it is seven feet from the property line. If you measure the corner of the house where the first floor is, it is seven foot six, okay? Now, my, uh, they say in, in, in Angela's uh, explanation, she said that there's 19 square feet of, of uh, house that's within the 10 foot setback. As, you, as I told you, seven feet and seven foot six, that's not 10 feet. So that's what those drawings and the drawing that Angela showed, that's the area that's within the 10 foot setback. It says in the ordinance that I'm trying to get a variance for that that the, uh, I can only add on in the encroachment area 50% of what's existing. Now, Angela said that that is 19 square feet that's existing in the encroachment area. That means I can only add half of that, which is, was that uh, eight, yeah, nine foot, nine and a half square feet. Well, Basically. That, excuse me, but that's why you're asking for a variance. So can you wrap this up? Because uh, for some reason, our timers aren't working. And yeah, I'm not sure if it's a tech issue there. Pardon yeah, me? It's not, it's not working, but I mean, 
we're, we're only supposed to have three minutes per speaker, and and this uh, and you know we have a couple of other speakers, and then we have to confer. And I think, uh, it, it, can you sum up what you have to say? Okay. Uh, this is a minuscule variance that I'm asking for. Okay, and the the. The, uh, I am asking to fill in the cantilever and go out an additional uh, six, uh, four feet. Four foot two inches, I think, is the overall. I'm asking to go beyond the existing house. The footprint, of it, they refer to, when I've talked to the planners, they've referred to a first floor footprint and a second floor footprint, which does not appear anywhere stated in the ordinance that I'm allegedly violating, okay? Uh, but for the purposes of this, uh, my argument has been that my overall footprint is the, foot, is the portion of the house that's closest to the property line, not the one that's farthest back. Now, the ordinance says that you can measure the area that's in the encroachment area by square footage or by length. It's easier to understand by length. The amount of area that's in the encroachment area of my house that's existing is seven foot two on the first floor. It is, it is nine foot two on the second floor. The portion of the house that's under the cantilever, uh, the portion that I would be filling in does not change the footprint of that house. I'm just filling it in. So okay, okay. the M only portion Mr. that Me. I'm adding is the four feet beyond, M Mr. and Me, that's only 45% of what's existing. Okay, so I think you've made your point over and over, you're, but I don't think there's a really a need to be that contentious because I don't think you're gonna get much opposition here. So, okay. uh, so um, thank you, f uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you for coming in. I'm sorry you had to go through this, but everybody does when, when you need a variance. Um, so next we have um, the neighbor, Norm Goodkin, and then followed by Laura Smith. And uh, as I said, I'm going to use my are, phone as a timer. Yeah, okay. I found that one, since okay. this one's not working. The, we ha normally there's a light that goes on when it's three minutes, but all right, so go ahead, Mr. Uh, Goodkin. Thank you. Uh, I'm Norm Goodkin, Calabasas resident since 1979 and the direct neighbor of uh, Jim, uh, Jim Me, uh, and Tandy. Really good neighbors. Uh, Jim built us a replacement fence that was going down between our house. He did that, uh, did that for uh, splitting the cost of the materials. I mean, he's been a really good neighbor. We really get along well. I have absolutely no objections to this proposal. I'd love for you to approve it. And I'm going to help out by sitting down now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you're the most impacted uh, property owner. So, okay. So, n I'm sorry. Next, it's um, Laura Smith, if you want to come in and state where you are from. Hi, I'm Laura Smith, and I am um, the neighbor on the other side of Sandy and Jim Me, and um, I also support the variance. I was born and raised in Calabasas. <laughs> I'd give the year, but I don't want to date myself. <laughs> um, and uh, I know, and that was in Molewood Heights, right across the highway. Lived in a few different places, came back to, Cal to California, um, and uh, was very lucky to take up residence next to Sandy and Jim. They truly are phenomenal neighbors, and um, they've done a lot to help me through the transition and everything as well. And I hope that they, I, you know, I see it as the spirit of their, um, F, their project is to continue to have a place to live as a family and to support their, their um, father, you know, Sandy's father. And um, I would hope that the city would be supportive of that. And I don't see any impact on visually even. It's the second floor is already there. So visually there's not much impact. So 
I'll keep it short too. So that's all thank you. Say. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just note for the record that we have received a lot uh, correspondence on this item, unlike the last one, uh, but all, all in favor, basically. Uh, so if that's it for speakers, then we'll close the public hearing and uh, any questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Turn the mic on. In the previous project that we considered, I asked the question about why do we have these kinds of setbacks controlling the construction of additions to homes or even the planning of a home in the first place. And I'm actually sad to hear that it's been so um, random, I guess is the best way to describe what's affected you here. Um, if, if we didn't have a 10-foot setback in this instance creating this, I'd say, constraint is the best way to describe it, um, what might we normally consider would be the public safety and or architectural or aesthetic constraint that we might want to assign if we we're creating a problem like that overhang seems to have created from the time it was constructed. So um, help me understand uh, why our, um, our procedures and our processing of this and this might be something for Matt to help me with, really. It's not even a design issue. It's a, it's a legal you know, conformity uh, standard that we set in a project. And 20, 30, 40 years later, you know, it has an impact that's quite substantial that doesn't need to be if we were, frankly, just to say, hey, the logic of all this is such that why does it matter? That's what each of the speakers has said. But I'm, I'm looking to make sure that we're not setting a precedent and not saying that I'm looking to create any additional obstruction here, but um, are we in fact creating a problem for ourselves in the future with, with variance issues when it comes to setbacks? We've had some pretty complex things like, you know, the, the condominiums on the lake you know, where they have a, they share a common wall, but there's about like four inches of airspace between the two condos or whatever it is. And we have to try to make a, a judgment on how much they can build when they really affect a neighbor because it's a common wall virtually, even though there's soundproofing in, in the space. Maybe you can help me with that. Yeah, so the, each variance is tested on its own. So one variance does not automatically create a precedent for another's, at least on the legal basis, obviously political, something else. Uh, here, the reality of this is that we're, we're hamstrung by what the county approved. When this was built in 1969 under the county, 30-ish year, 30 years before the city was incorporated. That's when I bought my house. Yeah. In Mullwood. And yeah, as I say, you know the, you know the neighborhood better than, than anybody. Oh, yeah. That's, These where are, that's why we're a city now, is because we had that kind of nonsense. Right. In, so in we're... In L.A. County. And, and that's the that's the reality. We're we're looking at what we were left with from the county. So the county allowed things with uh, five foot setback. This was built with about a seven foot setback, um, and our code, of course, is a ten foot setback. So that's why the code allows for additions within certain bounds, less than half of the area that's. Uh, encroaches in the setback is non-variance above the half you need to variance with the appropriate findings. And the intention is to have a standard but allow for relief from the standard if the, if the findings can be met when as here there's no, as it appears if the commission so finds, no impact to public safety and you've heard from the neighbors. And if there's nothing else from staff yeah, and if there's nothing else from the, the commission, does anybody else have questions? I don't have questions. I have I have a comment. Oh, okay. Because I'll make the motion yeah. otherwise. Okay. <laughs> well, just just very quickly, um, I, I feel that after Angela's presentation, uh, the the issues and the existing conditions and the proposed conditions were very clear to me, um, and. Uh, 
I'm convinced, kind of apropos of what you're talking about in terms of you know, why we find ourselves here and how we find ourselves here, um, I mean, I'm convinced that the, just the irregular shape of this lot um, provides a situation where we can clearly reach the required findings uh, for a variance. Uh, and it, it, this is the very, to me, this is the very situation where we should exercise our discretion um, in order to in order to approve this project. So, any other comments? Or I, I have a, just one brief a question of council. Sure. On the findings, finding number two, that granting the variance is necessary for the preservation and enjoyment of substantial property rights possessed by other property owners in the same vicinity. What do you think it means by the term substantial property rights possessed by other <laughs> property owners? Mm -hmm. uh, what, are, what kinds of property rights are they talking about? The right to build a cool kitchen or? This must be from the, the code. Right to have a <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the right to uh, modify the property consistent with the others in the area. So consistent with the market standard for the area is, is sort of a layman's summary of how I, how that would be tested. If no one else had put in an underground bowling alley, this, that may be pushing the <laughs> right. limits. Exactly, of the that would be, right. that'd be too far. Okay, because I agree with uh, Commissioner Fosberg as to finding one, which is usually the kind of tricky one, um, the shape of this lot is such that it, it falls within the few variances that we have granted over the years. I did also want to reiterate um, council point that a variance that we grant is not a precedent. This isn't mm -hmm. a legal proceeding like an appellate court that would pre you know, present a precedent. I know people will, will argue in the future, well, you gave this to the Mies, why can't we get it? Well, because you're a different project and you're trying to put it in a bowling alley. So that would be a different situation. But thank you, Matt, for explaining mm -hmm. too, because that's the only one I, I struggle with a little bit is how broad is that substantial property right to be? Right, and I think here the other component that the commission may consider is that I, as I understand it, many of the other similarly cantilevered homes in this, in this vicinity have filled in that cantilever. Um, and mm. there, which also I think taps into finding three, or I'm sorry, four regarding the safety improvements that are, in, in earthquake safety improvements that can be inherent in uh, having a single wall all the way up and down. Yeah, I mean, I'd have a different view if this if this um, variance were pushing it right up to the property line, right? Because then you then you do have some safety concerns. Oh, I think staff would have the same concerns given the county five foot clear of the sky requirement right. on fire safety. Okay. If That's I can it. add one more thing, and that is that having been a, a the first owner or buyer of the, my house, you know. At the time that these homes were being marketed, many of them were sold on the basis that you have an unfinished bonus room capacity here. Mm -hmm. So you can say, well, the house is actually smaller and more financeable at the time, and that's when interest <laughs> rates were 6 and 7%. It, everything was a, a trick. And my guess is that this cantilever was a way of giving the folks an option to either have a built out bonus room, which could be anything. It could be a den, a bedroom, not a bowling alley, John, I don't think, but. <laughs> bowling alley's okay. Well, <laughs> if you have the space and it's not encroaching on your neighbor's property. Well, you know? we've improved, we approved one in the Oaks. Yeah. I would say so, there's some up there, yeah. I mean, there's a number of reasons and we oftentimes lose that, and as we incorporated, we said, you know, we're not going to tolerate all that Mickey Mouse stuff, even though you can't fix what was or is even. You say from now on, and whenever someone comes in, we're going to make sure that we're fair to everybody, and that we're also safe, and that we're also, you know, going to promote aesthetic and, you know, livability, and I'll use the line that you taught me to use now. We're the number one enviable community in the United States for the quality of life that we have here. So I said that last night at the council meeting, in fact, dealing with the issues that we were facing tomorrow, last night. And 
if we take that attention, it's easy enough for me to say right now that I would move if you don't have anything else to say, Michael. I don't want to preempt you, but I would um, move that we direct staff to prepare a resolution for approval um, on this you know, variance 2023-03. And um, everything is adequate in the record to justify those findings and the questions have been answered. So let's um, move on. Is there a second for that motion? I will second and just to be technically correct, Please. and also ZCL 2023-083, make sure we get the full resolution. Right. Is it for both items? Yeah, okay. Yes. <clears throat> All right, any further discussion? No, I mean, this was an easy, for me, this is easy. So this is a variant situation, and that's why we have variances, because we can't imagine all the strange thing, you know, lots of shapes and so forth. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so you have it unanimously. And I hope your father-in-law uh, recovers soon. And we admire your perseverance, and we ask for your indulgence, and I hope your pop gets well soon and can enjoy the house. Thank you all. So next, uh, we have the director's report. Um, any report from you, Tom? Or? Only to tell you what's up for your next meeting. Michael, sorry you couldn't be here this evening, but um, so I'm just going to fill in by saying one thing, and that is you do have a meeting on the 21st. We have a single-family home edition that is uh, Got its public notice going out, and so that is definitely a meeting we're going to have. It's I'm sorry, what day? Dece uh, two weeks, December uh, 21st. 21st, yeah, in, three, in two weeks, right. Two weeks from the night. So it's another addition to a residence, anything? It's a single-family home addition. Okay. Right, and uh, that will be in Founders Hall because work will be going on in here. Oh, okay. Good night, okay. everybody. Uh, what, oh, what are they doing in here? They're doing upgrades. The, everything in here is 15 years old. So that just, in terms so, of the technology so in particular. Oh, okay, right. I forgot about. Okay, 15 doesn't sound old to me. So anyway, the, so trying, the screen, to so the screen, an example of it tonight. Tom, so the screens oh. will work and the and the slides will slide. <laughs> and we'll have well, timers. And, and, we, we and my not. bald spot won't be the highlight of the lighting oh, in the yeah, place. You know. Right. The so. lighting does, show, anyway. All right, well, thank you. Are, are there any reports from planning commissioners? Well, I have to just announce, I hope that our new commissioner will be impaneled at that time because the 21st, the shortest day of the year, <laughs> or the d longest darkness of the year in any case, it's not a shorter day. That's my middle son's 50th birthday, and I'm not sure that this won't interfere with that party. Probably won't, but in case, I want to at least put you on notice that you don't have to put up with me on the 21st. And I will, I will not be here. Oops. We still have a quorum if we have a new I commission. cannot be here on the 21st. So, well, if we have Bob and Michael and me, that's a quorum. Right. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. I'm well, you have here. Let me see. your new so commissioner here. I mean, he's been informed of that meeting, and so far I haven't heard that he can't make it. I will not be here on the 21st. Oops. Oh, okay, now, now we're in trouble. I'm out of town. So. What, what happens to our timing in okay. managing this particular uh, project? Well, I don't have, it's not my project, so I can't tell you specifically where it falls in the Permit Streamlining Act do phase we, of do things. Do we know? I think we're okay, yeah? The, yes, the project was just deemed complete today and public hearing notices just oh. went out today. We can re-notice. I mean, if we can't get a quorum for a meeting, we obviously can't have a meeting, and that's we'll just have to reschedule it. And if that's the case, we'll send follow-up notices accordingly. Is, okay. is, does we have it, two uh, out and likely three. Does it appear to be an extensive process? It doesn't. I, mean, I don't know the case. It's the 21st of December. Right. Well, it, whether it's a straightforward one or one that's more complex, it still requires a hearing, so it still no, requires no, I, a quorum I understand, to meet. Sometimes it goes 20 minutes or, or an hour or five hours. So you know, that's what I'm trying to guess on the birthday party timing here. Well, it may depend on how much education we go through. <laughs> I think staff needs to confer internally and come back to the commission with uh, an estimate of the time for that meeting, okay. plus confer yeah, with the new I commissioner. 
-hmm. as to quorum and then yeah. if it can be held it it's held and if it can't it can't the meeting okay. isn't as a uh, addition to a single family residence is that project so how however long that takes to deliberate is kind of up to the commission but it's uh, no no variance nothing too complicated it's just for a site plan review for an addition well just bear in mind what I heard is that two commissioners are definitely out and a third is probably out which would leave Commissioner Leah me and a new guy at best who may or may not who may or may not well okay be here all right I think staff needs to pull Commissioner Leah and right. uh, Commissioner Pine and figure well, out from there. let us know we, right, we will then. certainly follow up and let you know what we find out all right, Thanks, unless there's anything else, we will uh, adjourn in memory of John Sawara, and uh, thank you all. Thank you, John. Thank you.